I, I was originally from Wisconsin, a little town called Spring Green. And our neighbor was this gentleman. Uh, he was just across the river. Uh, my father was a butcher along with my great uncle. Uh, they ran the Spring Green Haas and Haas butcher shop. But the family history goes back into Germany as stonemasons for actually eons. I don't know how long. But uh, this, of course, was the house that you all, many of you know, across the river uh, where Frank Lloyd Wright lived. And I would know this house since I was a little kid of five, six years old. I remember picking strawberries alongside of the hill with my mother and it goes on and on like that. And then there was his school that he started in like 1933 in an old bill, uh, former school that he had designed for his two aunts in 1902. And of course, this was also part of that property. And what happened is that this was a, uh, I did a series of boxes. This is one of them that is now in the University of Wisconsin collection of him standing on a balcony in, at Taliesin. But was that, and that's my father in the butcher shop in 1928 <laughs> when he was just, you know, a kid practically. But his uncle, who he was a partner with, they had to close the butcher shop in 1941 when, you know, you couldn't buy meat anymore. That was uh, what happened during the war because you needed a coupon. So my father went to Milwaukee with us and worked in a, a, an industrial plant, you know, for the war effort. And George, my great uncle, went across and became Wright's chief stonemason for the rest of his life. And of course, this is him cutting rock at uh, one of the quarries just above Taliesin. I went there in 1955 to, and 56 in the summers to work with him ostensibly as his assistant, but really, and we kind of had a secret deal made where I could just roam around and really absorb what was going on at Taliesin, you know, at the time. And, you know, there were 50 or 60 apprentices and I would go in the studios every day. I would deliver things to uh, uh, Mr. Wright's uh, secretary every day and all kinds of other things. There's my uh, great uncle building this wall, which I helped him with, by the way. <coughs> and um, I even took a picture of that uh, later uh, with my son standing on it, you know, saying, I built this thing 45 years ago, so, you know, and he would look at it and he said, I don't believe that, you know, I get, I get, forget it, you know. This is one of the works of my uncle at, at Taliesin. When I went out there, I started making a lot of drawings around that time when I was 19, 20 years old, as I was working there, and watercolors, etc. I had a book of Cezanne, you can see that, was the first book I bought for two dollars. <laughs> and at night I would go back and I'd say, I can make, I, mean, I was, you know, really into doing architecture, so I was sort of doing my own architecture, secretly. The cabin in the woods, your typical one. <laughs> and there were dozens more, which I won't bore you with. But we're fast forwarding now over a, a long period of time where I'm doing my abstract expressionist paintings and my color field paintings and my shaped canvas paintings and God knows what else <laughs> over a long period of time. But when I got to this loft around the corner here on Broom Street with its 12 foot high windows running for the full 80 feet along Broom Street and staring out at all these cast iron facades something kind of clicked again with me about the architecture that I had sort of left behind for many years that had been such a central focus of mine in the beginning. And I started to draw them. And then eventually I started making dry points and etchings of them. And that became kind of, you know, my obsession for quite a period of time. So here are some of those. There were dozens of them. There's actually a book of catalog resume that shows a lot more, including Donald Judd's building, and I remember doing that one, and then I remember he was in the street watching me, he came out and he said, what am I doing, and then I, we talked, and uh, I, 
I, I gave him a print, and he gave me not a sculpture, unfortunately, <laughs> but a handshake. <laughs> Anyway, so you recognize these buildings. The great news is that most of them are still with us. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that has to do with efforts on a, many people's part, myself included, uh, in saving and sort of landmarking this neighborhood. And of course, I, I even moved further uptown. You know, life never really did exist beyond 14th Street for most of us at that time. It was Canal Street to 14th, and that was it. You know, venture into Chinatown for a cheap meal, come back, you know, maybe have an Italian meal over here, and that was it. But eventually I started to discover the whole world of architecture that exists in New York, moving all the way up through the island and beyond to what we would call the United States. And I also got so involved that I began to make dioramic boxes peering into these streets, lighting them, you know, it, the ambient light and so on. And my first show was right over here at 100 Acres Gallery. Does anyone remember 100 Acres yeah. Gallery? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was, a, you know, Ivan Karp's sort of annex. And uh, I did a show of those prints that I showed you, some drawings that I had also done, and then a whole room full of these boxes about Soho. And that was what kind of got it, it going for me on West Broadway and other places. So these are some of those original ones. And they even focused me more on the architecture and, and on the neighborhood and the whole concept of it. I even got involved in the subways and did a whole series of boxes of, you know, as you go down to the subway and the different layers. But then, very shortly after that, I started to come up with some more conceptual ideas. And one of them was, of course, everyone had seen those twin towers that were built down below us. They kind of dominated a southern view. And uh, artists were focusing on all kinds of ways to deal with it. Uh, my idea was to take a one-on-one -on -one measuring in two shadows, one of the Empire State and one of the Chrysler, as they would exist one-on-one -on, -one on the sides of those two towers on the north end. But that led to other, another idea. I said, what about an aviary for eagles connecting the two, you know? <laughs> that was a little outrageous. But it did, and the, the shadow one, I even investigated the possibilities and it was quite feasible give or take two or three million to do it at the time. But we didn't go too far with that. Uh, <laughs> he was doing his thing already, yeah. And I started finding other walls that existed on the exact sites of where certain buildings had stood and then fallen. And this is the Singer building, which was on Broadway, yeah. uh, right uh, behind where the World Trade was. And that was the shadow of the Singer. That was the tallest building in New York for exactly four years. Today, they're, they don't last as long as four years. This was St. John's Chapel, which as you came out of the tunnel over here, that was the tallest tower in New York for many years and gone completely in the late 19th century. And this was, of course, on 42nd Street where this wonderful Temple Emmanuel was at one time, and the shadow came back to that. It's funny, all these sites have changed since then, but completely, but there they were at the time in their interesting way. And then, of course, I started looking at all these different facades that were blank here around Soho, which was, you know, something that was very common all over New York, but probably more prevalent here than almost anywhere. And that one was one of about four sites that I identified and did some preliminary drawings for. That was one of the first. You can see it was a little different than the other. And I always had included the building behind it. I said, that's, you know, Giotto's Campanile. <laughs> that was another with the Campanile still in intact. And then finally, uh, I went to see Doris Friedman. Uh, Paul Goldberger introduced me to her and said, this is somebody that might be able to help you on a project. And uh, she didn't have much time. She was very busy. She said, I'll give you 10 minutes. What have you got? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I had photographs blown up 
of a before after situation. I said, here's one on, you know, uh, 10th or 6th Avenue, here's another one. And, and I laid them all out on her desk, before, after, before, after, before, after. And it included the one we just saw earlier there. And she said, oh, cancel my next appointment <laughs> and let's talk, you know. And that's kind of what, you know, led it to happen. Uh, she was incredibly, you know, connected here in New York and was somebody who kind of knew how to take something from A to Z. And that's what she pretty much did. She said, you know, you do the drawing at scale and then I'll do the rest. Now this is a facsimile pretty much of what the drawing was that I did. I spent six months on the drawing and we spent, what, four weeks on the painting. <laughs> that's not unusual. <laughs> but. This is a reproduction of it from the drawing, the, the maquettes, but I, I glued the two together. One part was in Chicago, one part was in New York. I put the two together and then did some changes and improvements and adapt, adapting to its current situation. But anyway, once we had the maquette, she gave it over to what were then the sign painters that did, you know, the cigarette ads. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was the main money then, you know, these guys, they were mostly Italian. They had, you know, done this forever. They didn't even have to, they just looked at it and said, can I cut it up? And I said, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but they took it, they tied a, a, a hole in the top, you know, and they dragged it up on these scaffolds. And, uh, you know, they, they were there within a matter of days, putting in windows like that. And every day I would go for lunch at Finelli's. That was th the main stop. And you know, many other artists who I knew were also there. And, w and I think it was Alex Cass came and he said, there's something going on out there. <laughs> and, <laughs> and several of us would go out on the street and it was, it was the dead of winter and we were all looking at it and I'm, I'm just looking at it with them. And they said, do you know what's going on? And I said, no. <laughs> 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 and uh, you know, finally, uh, I think one of them said, this is the beginning of something. <laughs> well, it happened so fast that within two and a half weeks, it was there, literally. Because these guys had a different approach. Now, you don't want to look at it too closely. <laughs> Their brushes are about that big. They're using this old, you know, oil paint that were used for, for ads. But that was it at the time. And it was finished, you know. And I was always, of course, very excited and interested that I could fit all these two, win you know, the two windows exactly into the schemata of the whole thing. And that was kind of what the driving idea was. How did I measure it? I would crawl out on a window. I think it was in Hanford's <laughs> studio that I, and measure everything, you know, like carefully and make a little drawing so that I had the measurements. There were no, you know, uh, elevation drawings or anything I could work from then, so. That was how we got it uh, together. Well, needless to say, that led to some other things happening. I said it was not unlike an atomic explosion in the art and architecture world at the time. I mean, some people might check that out, but it, it really was. It, uh, it, it gravitated to such a degree that for many years after, when I would get off of a plane, whether it was in Berlin or Beijing or whatever, there would be something imitating it <laughs> in, in any number of these countries. But as you all know, it, it has suffered tremendously. And that's, this is even much worse later. And it is definitely in need of its renewal. And I think, you know, when Susan called me, Susan Vogel, I don't know, two years ago now or more, and said that they were very interested in doing that. Uh, that got us into this next phase. This is one in uh, 110 Livingston Street in Brooklyn, a uh, building that uh, two trees with David uh, Walentis d redeveloped. And he had a courtyard that needed help. And so I put back some of, because it was a McKim Mead and White building, I put back some of McKim Mead and White's lost facades in that area. And another project on 83rd in York where 
there was a new building being constructed and Jules Demchik, who I knew, who was the developer of that building, said, I've got a building across the street with some graffiti on it. What are we going to do? And he said, I went over to the owner and I offered to paint it and I would get an artist to do the work. And that's how this project was actually done. And I looked at it and I said, well, there's not a lot of room to work on here. You know, there's a lot of windows and so on. He said, well, do what you can. So I decided that the corner was the main element and what it needed really was a glockenspiel. And so we put this, what we call glockenspiel for Yorkville back. And, you know, I, I was reminded of the one in Munich, you know, which goes around like this and so on in place. But instead, I have New York policemen, you know, mounted policemen, kind of going <laughs> out. And they took the photo <laughs> I took the photographs of them uh, when, I, when, you know, Crystal was doing the project and there were all these mounted policemen. I was going around photographing more of the horses than the gates. Uh, and now this drawing is in the uh, Museum of the City of New York, along with several other drawings. <laughs> this is one of several mosaics that I did when I went to Italy uh, a few years, quite a few years back, and there was a series of banks that needed mosaics on them, on the facades. And this one is in Forest Hills, which is a really exciting neighborhood that I sort of discovered at the time. And that was the, the maquette for it. And anyone who knows Forest Hills knows that it was a planned area. There were many interiors that I also did in New York, and one of the most important ones was, of course, the New York Public Library periodical room. I don't know how many have been in the periodical room. Two, three, yeah. four. Not many go there. <laughs> but uh, it, it's still functioning and it's doing well, and it was also restored a few years ago. And then another one, we put a theater back which wasn't there, which is now, a, I think, a pawn shop. <laughs> And then in this blank area, which sort of sat there for no reason, we decided to do a, an homage to Leadbelly, who was a, a, a citizen of the, of the prison for 10 years. But in uh, Fort Worth, there was this mural. I did six projects in Fort Worth over a period of time, but this particular one seems to have stuck. And it's the you know, homage to the Chisholm Trail, which happened to run through where this building is in the center of town. Uh, and it kind of, you know, had its own, you know, it, it, the, it was on a lot. They were going to tear the building down. They said, no, no, it's got a historic front. We better leave it. Well, then it, it went on and on like this. And finally, the Bass Brothers, who bought Fort Worth a, about 30 years ago, uh, <laughs> decided that they were going to restore it along with a dozen other major things in that area. And this is what it is today. It has this, you know, dancing fountains in front. It has a, it's a plaza. It's the center of the city, Great. which is kind of wonderful. And a, a couple more, finally, here, the, here we are in, uh, of all places, uh, Philadelphia, where we were last night again. And this mural was the, what, there before any of those Philadelphia murals happened. There are about, what, 500 or more now? And it was the kind of the earliest one. And that got restored as well a few years back and quite wonderfully restored. And that led to another project that I just finished last year, which was about Philadelphia's historic architecture. And th that was done last year on a site in old Philadelphia. That's your old town. And that's it <laughs> for that. It's old city. It's an old city. Old city. Is that what it said? <laughs>
uh, in the fact that when kids create, they do not destroy. And we help them to do that, they will be there forever. 